I've always resisted um, in Mendham's characterization of our condition as unwilling participants in a game. Um, but I suppose from a certain perspective we are. Um, I guess the game, in my opinion, is necessity. We're stuck here. Um, there are things that we can't control. We're puppets on strings in a certain way. Um, I cannot control again right where I am right now. I am here. That is a brute fact. Uh, if we jettison guilt, it isn't my fault that I'm here, even though it was me who put myself here. It just is. This is the result of past actions, and I'm here now as a result of that. Um, and I can't change that. I can only make take steps now to change it, but I, the fact right now, here and now, in the present, I am here. That's my view of determinism, that which is determined. Now, <clears throat> let's say um, let's say that we are pieces on a chessboard and we're pawns. Um, I think making that concession is important, at least in terms of addressing it, um, addressing the ideas, because you have to sort of deconstruct what the implications are of every possible um, every possible analysis of what it means to be a pawn. Because we can say that a pawn is completely at the mercy of the chess players. And as you say, it's just bait. It's just there to either be ignored and then turned into an important piece later in the game, or it's there to draw out the other stronger pieces. Um, from a God's eye or bird's eye point of view, it hardly matters, though, what we are. If we're queens or rooks or bishops or pawns, it doesn't really make any difference because we're simply being used. Which is my view, I think, of human equality. Um, it doesn't really matter if you're Donald Trump or if you're a bum laying in the gutter. Um, you're just a, as much a pawn of necessity as anybody else is. Uh, you're equally pawns. I don't really think that the people at the top of the heap have really any great advantage over anything. They simply do what they do as pieces on the chessboard. They're just as much subject to necessity as I am. Um, and this kind of is my way of explaining the fact that I agree with the Jane idea that there's no point in appealing to the gods to help you get out of this mess that we're in because the gods too are trapped um, in existence. Um, so, okay, we might be pawns, we might be rooks, we might be queens, we might be kings. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter. Um, somebody else is moving us around the board for their edification, not ours. Now, I don't think Inmendum is attempting to tell me that there's something playing with us here. It comes across that way in the metaphors that he uses a lot, but I, you know, Poetic license, right? you got to allow for that. Now, <clears throat> let's delve deeper into this idea. Um, I mentioned Stephen King's metaphor in Sometimes They Come Back, where um, he describes uh, this apparition that has been taken over by a more powerful apparition, a ghost or something like this, or a... Um, demon even, I don't know what it what it's supposed to be but it's just like, you know, it's an evil spirit and it's been taken over by another one something like um, what you saw in the Matrix but it's not totally transformed into something else you know when um, like one of those soldiers is turned into um, you know, one of the uh, I, think I forget what they're called enforcers, the big shots, you know um, with wearing the dark glasses, the men in black something like that um, a ghost is overpowered by another ghost but his will is taken away from him. He can't move. He can't speak. Something else is controlling his faculties. 
and he said the it kept talking but it was talking with an expression on its face like a puppet who's just come to life only to find out it's still on strings I just I just love that metaphor um, Stephen King's really good at at um, describing things like this and you know horror is sort of a universal thing in that you know the way that we phrase it is different but the overall themes the overall fears seem to be the same now let's say that we are pieces on a chessboard let's just allow for that and and not just allow for it for the sake of argument I'm going to say in a certain way we are from a certain perspective from a certain perspective we're not uh, from a certain perspective we both are and are not etc etc Siadvada the um, Jane theory of maybe or perhaps or in some ways so here I am I am a pawn on the chessboard now you meant you mentioned something that your mind simply doesn't work in that way the first person perspective isn't something that um, the experiential perception isn't something that you're trying to deal in here I understand that but you understand that you're that that's not uh, that, that that's that's your limitation like I'm not saying that it's wrong that you are this way um, but you understand that um, you're approaching this from a stance that rules out any possibility of me communicating effectively my point of view now this doesn't in, in a certain sense this is kind of the logjam which if we just admit is unbreakable um, I think that w there's no problem there like if we just sort of say that I see things from the driver's seat perspective you see things as an analysis of the overall picture the overall you know you're outside of the car I'm inside of the car you're watching what the car does I'm driving the car or I'm in the car watching it be driven for me or something like this um, both perspectives are equally valid now what I would try and do is try and reconcile the two um, and not sacrifice one view to the other and now the thing is trying to describe things from an exclusively external perspective versus to describing it from an exclusively internal perspective um, is somewhat slanted in, in, in both cases now you describe things from a strictly external perspective and I believe that um, a lot of antinatalist literature does that that's how Benatar describes the human condition that's how Sakfi describes the human condition that's how Ligotti and people like that describe the human condition that's how um, that's how Schopenhauer describes the human condition he sort of analyzes it as in a sort of subject-object sort of way he's looking at it they're all looking at it in a somewhat scientific detached kind of sense and um, they're relying on the scientific method and logic and things like that to draw their conclusions now <clears throat> like I've mentioned the flaw I think in Zafi is the fact that he says A the, the exterior is all that there is and B um, uh, B there is no way out he just smashes you with this idea that existence equals e existential panic and there's nothing else nothing we can do about it well, that's nice anyone can say that you can't do anything about the situation you're in it doesn't make it true uh, Benatar reduces us to logical formulae um, and he sort of says unless the scientific method can demonstrate it then I'm not interested okay that's nice problem is the scientific de um, method can't demonstrate anything in terms of experience it can't because experience doesn't work like that it's incompatible but are we going to deny that experience happens if if, if Benatar is going to deny that experience happens then he's going to have to deny the fact that suffering happens because suffering is an experience um, 
So, you know, we have... I, th there's that objection. I'm not just analyzing a big picture thing here. Um, that's an objection that I have to most of the, if not all, of the um, life-denying, again, forgive the use of the term, life-denying um, thinking out there. It strikes me that that's how it is. Even Jainism, that fascinates me so much, tends to, as I say, I like them better than the Gnostics because they resort far more to logic. Their own version of logic, which is quite different from ours, but it's still, it, it works on its own terms. They rely a little bit too much uh, in that regard. Um, I think the Buddhists do the same thing, and many of the more rarefied uh, heights of Hinduism do this, like Advaita Vedanta, the non-dualistic stuff. Now, the qualification I place on that is that at least in the East, there's a practice to sort of experience this stuff. There doesn't seem to be much of that in the West, but it's changing. This seems to be changing. The objection to that people would have to my um, point of view, uh, as a quote-unquote, equally inaccurate, by the way, life affirmer, um, is that I'm focusing too much on my own perspective. Now, I'm only, I'm not saying that that's not a valid um, objection. First of all. But my sort of, in my own defense, I would say that I'm saying that everyone else can do this as well. But where, where I think it's legitimate, where the objection really does sort of hammer home or hit home, is when you actually try to talk about your experiences. Um, not an easy thing to do. I made a video a while back, quite a while back, where I was sort of, you know, talked into describing my practices. And my, essentially my practices are this. It's just basically a means of familiarizing myself with what I am. Um, it's a means of being conscious of what I am and what is happening to me. I, in other words, I uh, I want to actually, in some sense, um, analyze my experiences in real time. That's looking at things which you say you're not comfortable with from the pawn's point of view. The puppet that actually has come to life to discover that he's still on strings. What does it mean to exist? What does it mean to exist in the moment of becoming? Um, some people's minds simply don't seem to be put together in such a way as to either allow for that or to um, emphasize it, I guess. Guilt is the greatest weapon against that, because they can say, "Well, you're sitting there staring at your navel. Rome is burning." Um, a legitimate objection, but again, I would say everyone else is free to do this. I'm not stopping them. Well, you can't do that when your house is burning down around you. You can't. Why can't you? Why can't you focus on your moment of becoming when you're? strapped to a rack and you're being stretched. I'd say you have very little choice at that moment but to blot everything else out. Or what happens naturally is everything else gets blotted out and you only think of yourself. Do those who suffer only think of themselves? I would say that that's kind of almost inevitable that that would happen. You simply can't worry about the problems of the world when your spine is being cracked by being stretched. Okay, I don't begrudge people that. I don't begrudge people who are starving to death in sub-Saharan Africa right now, if I think there are a few. I don't begrudge them um, complete indifference to the pain that I feel when I stub my toe. I get it. 
they have other things on their plate. Or when I, um, I don't know, if my house burned down or something catastrophic happened to me, I don't blame them for not feeling terribly empathetic towards me. You know, this rubbish about first world problems. Um, all right. Um, what gives the sufferer more claim to being selfish than the non-sufferer? I, I don't, I'm not sure I understand that. I'm not sure that that's made clear. I think it's just assumed. It's just assumed that we must empathize with the sufferer and not with the non-sufferer or with the person who is actually in a, um, in a place that they actually want to be and are comfortable in. Um, guilt is what does it. Now again, I'm not saying that, um, I'm just analyzing that point of view. What prevents, um, what what seems to make it legitimate for the sufferer to not empathize with the non-sufferer is guilt, um, or a great de or a greater amount of sympathy with the person who suffers than the person who is in a plus situation, the exact opposite of suffering. Now. <clears throat> That's one objection that I have, because I would say, if you're on the torture rack, you're allowed to ignore me. Our ethics work that way. But if you're on the torture rack, I'm not allowed to ignore you. See what I'm saying? Um, that's one objection. The second objection that I have is that the, there, there's, an, there's, an, there's an assumption that there is no plus version of being on the torture rack. There's no actual benefit um, to counteract. Like, this is Benatar's asymmetry, which I think has been thoroughly refuted. But they say that physical pleasures are the only ones that can possibly counteract human suffering. Or pleasures of you know, perhaps pleasures of the flesh or whatever. The problem is, of course, it's easy to demonstrate physical agony. It's very difficult to demonstrate physical ecstasy. Now again, you see, we're back at that scientific method thing. You can't, re you can't sort of get two people to do the same thing or observe the same thing and draw, you know, like if I, if I Say you, you take somebody at, in the sort of the heights of pleasure that you can find, you inject them with heroin, and they've never done it before. They're going to have the ride of their life, okay? But all I see is a person laying down with a small smile on their face, even though that they're in the most exalted possible state. Um, equally artificial to that enormous pleasure is the pain of someone having their spine pulled apart. That's just as artificial as taking heroin. It's just as unreal, just as unlikely to actually happen in the real world as the blast that somebody gets from heroin. But that's assumed to be more real. Why is that? Again, I think that that's a function of our present ethical system, um, which needs to be deconstructed and examined. Now... From the pawn's perspective, it's assumed that the pawn is powerless. But the pawn is only powerless in terms of his ability to influence the other pieces or to influence how they manipulate him. But in a big picture sense, he's no more powerless than the queen because they're both subjects of necessity. They can only do what can be done. They can only do what they can do, per determinism, right? Per the eternal present. They can only do what it is possible for them to do, and no more than that. And that makes the queen and the pawn equals, and equally trapped as well. It makes them equally powerful, and equally trapped. Um, 
there's always a bigger fish. Yeah, but there's always a bigger fish to eat. The fish who's always the bigger one. Necessity. Now, now we see that everybody in the moment of becoming is stuck there. Using our faculty of choice, our prohiresis, that's the Stoic word, you know, the Greek word, we can then make what we can of that brute reality. You're going to have to demonstrate to me that everybody else doesn't have the same capacity as I do to evaluate their own position and to influence their own experience of it. Um, I am not attempting to convince anyone to do this. What I'm merely doing is staking out the claim as an individual who has the ability to do this. Um, and I'm willing to pay the price of this in terms of people thinking that I'm nuts or that I'm callous or that I'm horrible or whatever. Um, I think I'm a born heretic, to be perfectly honest. Um, I can do something about my own experience of being a pawn on a chessboard. And I resent, or perhaps I don't even resent, but I reject the argument that says you can't do any better than the external view of what you are. You're limited to that. I don't know about that. Um, when we talk about the heights of physical pleasure, um, I think that we're stuck in things like orgasms or drugs or stuff like that, which kind of fascinated me in terms of, um, in Mendham saying that the orgasm or everything that goes along with it might actually make wor life worth living. Um, the philosophy and practices that I engage in are often brutally physical. The orgasm is involved in this. Um, but it's not the whole thing. A lot of people have a very, very skewed view of Tantra. There are a lot of completely celibate tantrics who never or deliberately avoid having orgasms, by the way, just so we know. Um, but the ecstasies that Tantra um, seems to plumb, I suppose, or seems to seek, I'm not going to say that they're there. I'm not going to say that they're actually phenomenally there. Because remember, ecstasy is an experience. It's not an absolute thing. Um, <clears throat> Tantra is aimed at refining your search for pleasure and your search for ecstasy and your search for exaltation and for awe and all the things that you that could possibly make being a pawn on the chessboard far more than merely worth it. Um, but these are deeply personal things and they're so hard to describe to other people that when you attempt to do so you inevitably look insane because when you're trying to describe something to somebody else you're now trying to speak to another conscious entity of what it means to be you and that is something that that other entity is not equipped to do if I'm on a pawn, if I'm a, if I'm a pawn on a chessboard and I want to tell another pawn what it's like to be me, they're so wrapped up in what it, what it means to be them that they can't really get into my skin. They're stuck with necessity, the necessity of their own existence, just as I am stuck with mine. My ability to communicate with that other person about my actual experiences is very very limited. Incidentally, I find women actually more able to verbalize this sort of thing when you listen to the way they speak to each other than men. Um, I won't go into the reason for that. I have no idea. It doesn't seem to matter to me. But there is a strong feminine um, thrust behind Tantra. Uh, Tantra is all about the, the mother goddess and the Shakti force, which is the ultimate feminine principle. The male principle allows the universe to go on existing, 
the feminine makes the ride worthwhile. The male principle is the how, the female principle is the why. Now, all these things are taking place internally. And to describe it is nigh on impossible, which is why um, any attempts to do so are so easily parodied and so likely to be misunderstood or understandably misunderstood. If you, if, if somebody sight unseen were to pick up a book, one of the books that I read about Tantra, in fact, just by coincidence, I have this one right here, Ajit Mukherjee, um, The Tantric Way, they'd probably think that it was just a pile of insanity. Um, it's just so alien to the way most people think. Because most people aren't used to delving into their own experiences almost as a way of life. Say, so what does it mean to be human? What does it mean to be me? And when you do this, again, it shocks other people because other people aren't used to thinking along those lines, and you tend to get anathematized, which is why always throughout history, esoterics have always been secretive, exclusive, uh, this kind of thing. I guess there's something ubermenschish about it. Um, and, you know, there's something aristocratic about it, even, although given the leisure that's available to everybody nowadays, or almost everybody, pretty much in the entire world, I'll, be, I'll, I'll tell you, um, um, or almost everybody, um, now that the objection that this isn't available to everybody is more and more difficult to sustain. But it's still going to be exclusive because people tend to sort of take what they see as all, like, as, as the reality of everything. People tend not to self-examine to any great amount, or it looks that way from my perspective. <clears throat> now, in Mendham examines the world, but he does so in terms of a critic. I examine the world in terms of a participant. In Mendham will examine the world in terms of an analyst, someone trying to figure it all out in a sort of a clinical detached way and I will say I'm trying to figure it out from a driver's seat perspective um, both sides I think um, are going to be considered heretical, insane preposterous, etc. I can't really see that an ethelist is, is likely to be more scoffed at than a tantric. In fact, I would say that an ethelist is probably less likely to end up <laughs> um, tied to a stake with a bunch of logs being piled at his feet. I'd say that, it, that, that the tantric or the, the esoteric or whatever is far more likely to disturb people to the point where he's actually turned upon. Um, So, even if we are just pieces on a board, there are many implications in that that I think need to be examined before we can make a final statement on what's the value of being a pawn on a chessboard. Um, it might not seem much to the outside observer, but that pawn could be having the time of his life, or he could be utterly miserable. But that pawn, if my experience is anything to go by, does have the option of participating in the value of his or her own experience. Um, that's kind of the great leveler. We all have the ability to put ourselves in the first person perspective. Um, even if we quite leave aside the idea of what the I is, it doesn't matter or if the I even exists, fine, well, I'll use another term for whatever it is that perceives that which is perceived. I don't care. <clears throat> there is the experiential level. If there is no actual experiential level, then, okay, the whole argument is made moot anyway, because if there's no experience, there's no suffering. 
Suffering is an experience. Point final. Um, so yeah, I understand the the objection that Amanda makes, but um, I would simply respond to that by saying there are other ways to look at it than your own. And even if you're a hundred percent right in what you're saying, it's only from that perspective. There are other perspectives out there. <laughs>